Hello and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Carrie Williams, the Associate Director for Alumni Events here at York University. Thank you so much for joining us today for our topic, uh, advanced, advanced Style Confronting Gendered Ageism Online, featuring Associate Professor, Professor Ella Versea. Yeah, it is more important than ever to acknowledge the land we are on to honor the people who are indigenous of Turtle, Turtle Island, their inherent rights to this land, uh, and because it is a really important step um, settlers can take as we work towards reconciliation and, and truths. Of course, this experience is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same place. Um, so the land acknowledgement I'm about to share might not be for the territory that you are currently on. And if this is the case, we ask you or invite you to take uh, the opportunity, the responsibility to acknowledge the territory you are on, as well as its current treaty holders. Uh, the website native-land.ca is a good uh, a resource for this. Uh, as a member of the community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York campuses are located that precede the establishment of the institution. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and Huron Wendat. It is home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, uh, which is an agreement to care and share for the Great Lakes region. Land acknowledgements must come from a, a true place of knowing informed by learning from Indigenous people. And I am so thankful for the opportunity to live and work and learn on Treaty 13 land uh, and for and will continue uh, to learn from Indigenous people uh, in the York community and beyond. York is preparing for the safe and gradual return to campus in the very near future. Um, for the remainder of the summer term, York continues to maintain a two meter physical distancing requirement while some fitness and some in-person research activities will resume under step three. Complete details about the fall term will be shared in the coming weeks. Feel free to check our Better Together website for the most up-to-date information at yorku.ca slash better together. We have a question for you in the audience uh, and it is how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic confronting gendered ageism online? How would you rate your knowledge of that topic? A poll should uh, appear soon. Uh, we're so grateful that, that people take the time to, to join us sort of every other week uh, to learn. And the fact that you're willing to share a little bit about yourselves is also a real benefit. I'll just give everybody a moment to respond. See the results yet? I think I'm. Yes, there we go. Okay. So almost almost an even split between being new to the topic, somewhat informed, and minimal. So again, kudos to you for taking the opportunity to just continue your learning uh, with us. And thank you so much for coming today to learn about this topic. If you need help with the Zoom webinar, feel free to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is ready to help you. The same button can be used to submit your questions to our speaker during the Q&A portion following her presentation. And for those of you who are watching live on Facebook, uh, feel free to submit any questions or comments through the comment section of the video and the team will get them my way. I uh, want to remind you that all of your questions or comments are visible to our speakers and to the staff working behind the scenes, and we ask you always keep your comments relevant and respectful. Today's talk features Associate Professor and York alumna, Ella Verseer, IBBA 09 from the Department of Marketing and the PhD Program Coordinator at our Schulich School of Business. 
Her research focuses on understanding and promoting consumer diversity and market inclusion at the interplay of identity, technology, branding, and institutions, and has been awarded the prestigious Sidney J. Levy Award and the Ferber Award Honorable Mention, funded by the Social Sciences and, Humanity and Humanities Research Council of Canada. She has been published in the Journal of Consumer Research, the Journal of Advertising, the Journal of the Association of, for Consumer Research and Marketing Theory, and featured by, among others, First Company, Conversation, and Huffington Post. Most impressive. I uh, would like to please welcome, Steve, are you there? Maybe I don't see you. Hi, oh, good there afternoon. You are. There you are. <laughs> welcome. Uh, welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. I will now share my screen, optimize for video clip, um, and take it away. So I, I, I would like to thank the, the organizers first and foremost for inviting me to such a lovely event and all of you for taking the time to be here with us during your lunch hour. Um, today, I would like to talk about a shirk funded research on confronting gendered ageism in the fashion and beauty industries online. So I would like to start my talk with a poll question. Uh, now, do you think there are style rules for women over 50? And I'm hoping Jenny will help me with the poll. And it's a, it's a short yes or no question. And I'm, I'm sorry we cannot meet in person, but I'm super excited uh, to be able to talk to you all today via Zoom and to be able to have as interactive a session as possible for the next uh, little while that we have together. All right, so yes, of course, uh, there are indeed a ton of style rules for women over 50. And research has shown that in, in markets, in the fashion and beauty markets, uh, women, mature women, have either been ignored or pressured to conform to very strict style rules as well as anti-aging potions. So you have everything from 10 hairstyles that make you look younger to six things uh, women over 50 shouldn't wear, but six things women over 60 should wear, to 13 anti-aging tips and products, to anti-aging skincare routines for your 60s, uh, to a capsule wardrobe for mature travelers, to the instant eye lift makeup tutorial for women over 50. So there really is a plethora of style rules that are very strict for women, especially in North America that are dictated by the fashion and beauty industries on what to do and especially what not to do for women over 50. So of course my co-author and I were thrilled when we came across uh, something called the advanced style movement. And I'm not sure if some of you have heard of this already, but it was a blog and an Instagram account that was created in 2008 by a street style photographer in New York, his, by the name of Ari Seth Cohen, who decided to photograph of uh, fashionable women, everyday fashionable women. So they weren't necessarily models and he looked for not women associated with the fashion and beauty industries and decided to celebrate their unique styles and uh, their break away from the very strict fashion and style rules of women their age through a blog and through an Instagram account and it even became a feature film documentary. So I thought to set the stage, I will next show you uh, the trailer to let you in on the advanced style movement, which will be the topic of my talk today. So hopefully this will work. Oh, perfect. Give me one second to set it up. There we go. I am dressed up for the theater of my life every day. I get such a kick out of it. I take it to the nth degree. 
Most people don't. At one time I had no self-confidence and I didn't think I could do anything. I came into my own about 10 years ago. So there we are. I feel the same as I did when I was 18, but I have fewer cares. I never wanted to look young. I wanted to look great. I think good style improves the environment for everybody. I don't find it very challenging to go to the fancy stores and just buy the latest trend. When I was 18, I wanted to go to Paris so you could turn it around and put the eight in front and the one in front. <laughs> there is no time limit to anything. When you look good, you look good. All right, and, and most importantly, uh, what, what, what is really, really cool about the advanced style movement is that it has launched the successful Instagram influencer careers of regular women over 50. So my co-author and I decided to center on this focal research question for our, our Shirk funded project. How do mature female influencers confront gendered ageism in the fashion and beauty market, specifically through their Instagram accounts? And to answer our research question, what we did was we engaged in a focused media and ethnographic investigation of the top 10 advanced style Instagram influencers in Canada and the US. And now I have my second poll question for you. How old do you think is the oldest advanced style influencer from these 10? And the poll is up and I'm excited to see what you think is the right answer. So we'll leave it up for a few seconds. Uh, but in the meantime, while the poll is going on, uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce the research methodology of ethnography, which is an online research method to understand social interactions as well as consumer behavior in contemporary digital communication contexts such as Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, blogs. And so it was the most appropriate research methodology for our particular context, especially since so much of the advanced style movement happened online. And so now the answer is uh, 89 was the, the most of you guessed. And the correct answer with 22% of those who took the poll was 99. And that is absolutely right. Our oldest uh, advanced style Instagram influencer is Iris Apple, and she is 99 years old, and she has she is known as a mega influencer with the, one of the largest, if not the largest, following from our our list of the top uh, advanced style influencers in North America. And so uh, our exclusive focus on North America advanced style influencers was really motivated by the gender biased obsession with youth youthfulness that characterizes this cultural context. And this table offers a more in-depth online portrait of our 10 influencers, which I won't go into detail for this presentation, but you could see uh, Iris Apple, uh, has indeed the largest following of influencers when we conducted this research in 2020 with 1.4 million followers on her Instagram account and it has only risen since. And so with the help of a research assistant, uh, what we ended up doing was we collected all the media so that, that came up with two, 299 documents of online media interviews featuring any of our 10 influencers, 93 online video interviews fe featuring any of our influencers, as well as overview media mentions of advanced style. So that was the, the uh, concentrated media data collection that we engaged in. And the netnographic component, what my co-author and I did was a 12 months a participant observation on Instagram where we followed the 10 influencers and collected field notes and saw what, how they engaged the fashion and beauty industry, what brands they collaborated with, what their fans said about them, how they, they posted, how often they posted, what stories they had, uh, and 
also some of them had blogs. So we also collected 487 posts from the influencers public blogs and all of this data that we collected it was publicly available online. Um, so we also made sure that all of the influencers Instagram accounts were public in order to better understand how they fight gendered ageism in the fashion and beauty markets and how this inspires other consumers um, and fans to do the same. And uh, so to recap, uh, the question we sought out to answer was how do mature female influencers confront gendered ageism in the fashion and beauty markets? And through our data collection and later data analysis, we found that they uh, do this through what we refer to as embodied resistance. So they have specific strategies of how they feature their faces, their bodies and clothing online through their various Instagram posts and stories um, that really, really are all about fighting gendered ageism and trying desperately to change the fashion and beauty market so that there are no more style rules for women above 50, as well as women are allowed to age however they want. So to move away from this youth obsession of, of having no wrinkles and no scars and smooth skin and colored hair, for life. And, and so uh, one of the, the, the findings that we came across is that the, all of the re influencers realization that a a gendered ageism is indeed real in the fashion and beauty industry. So uh, here they are saying in interviews across the media, as well as throughout their Instagram accounts, uh, Icon Accidental is from the US. So she said in the US, we're still twisted about age. Ageism in fashion is a real American thing. Greece, who is from Montreal, so she's Canadian. She's, she says, I'm disappointed. Women of my age are not represented on the runways and in magazines and fashion magazines. And this is echoed by the dynamic duo uh, uh, idiosyncratic fashionistas who are quoted as saying, we don't have a lot of style icons our age to go to in the media. And so they set out to change this. And one of the strategies that they engaged uh, in in order to change the uh, gendered and ageist fashion marketplace is to deconstruct these 50 plus fashion rules. So here's one such example for another, from another Canadian influencer by the handle of Bag and Beret, who says, uh, and is quoted as saying in a media interview, a few years ago, a woman of similar age passed by me on the sidewalk, scowled, then rasped. Really? I clearly had broken the as yet unwritten rule about wearing vintage corsets as day wear. But for me, now at 55, dressing has become a form of community care, or what I call style activism. I'm seen and heard now, even at the deli. One of the best unexpected rewards of my style activism is when I hear a woman change her tune from, I could never wear that, to, I'm wearing that with a big grin on her face. And here is an example of some of the Instagram posts where she's really breaking all the style rules of women over 50, which means to no longer wear colors, to no longer wear short skirts, to no longer um, wear flattering clothing, but rather balloon style clothes, and to no longer have fun with fashion. And here she is deconstructing all of these fashion rules and wearing corsets as day wear and trying to do this not only for herself, but, but for other women. So she is an inspiration and so are all the women that are part of the advanced style movement. And here is uh, another uh, example of this first strategy of deconstructing 50, 50 plus fashion rules. And this comes from Judith Maria Bradley, who is an influencer that's local to Toronto. So maybe one day when you're walking around, you too can see her. And here she is saying that I agree that diversity is essential and I don't want it to be a buzzword. So I started modeling only a few years ago and I don't like it when my age becomes the tokeny thing about me, like I'm the token senior. I want to be chosen because of my personality and what I bring to the shoot. 
So as part of their style activism and as part of deconstructing these 50 plus fashion rules and trying to make the North American fashion industry more inclusive, these advanced style influencers are very picky with the brands that they choose to collaborate with online on Instagram and in real life. So they don't want to be there just because they're the senior citizen of the group, but they wanna be there for their personality and their style and their flair and what they bring beyond just their age, which I think is really, really important. And then when it comes to the beauty industry, uh, they, they also engage in in a, a second strategy, with my, which my co-author and I refer to as defying the anti-aging market. So here they really stand for um, not succumbing to the gendered pressures of, for example, having gray hair or, uh, or having non-gray hair as a woman. Because for the longest time, the beauty industry has told women that it, it's clearly not sexy and you've let yourself grow if you have gray hair. But for men of a certain age, you're considered a silver fox and a sex symbol. And so that's where the gendered inequality comes in as well as the age factor because of the older women. So here is another one of our uh, advanced style influencers. And you could see across her uh, Instagram accounts and all of the collaborations that she does with fashion and, and lifestyle brands that she really embraces her gray hair. And she's quoted us saying, my hair is always integral to my look and a big part of it is letting my hair be gray. And then young people in particular began to see me and make comments about my style. And this feedback would induce me to take another risk and so on until I found myself no longer being invisible. So she was rewarded for her, um, in a way, courageous attitude towards letting her hair be gray, having it in a particular style that she likes, but not worrying about hair dyeing it. And her fan base on Instagram and beyond in real life only grew and people were inspired and the majority of our advanced style influencers also just let their hair be natural if it's great that's great if it has a little bit of color in it that's great and also dyeing it crazy colors because why not uh, the the beauty industry shouldn't dictate what we like for ourselves is is their opinion and an, another thing, um, another example, and the last example I'll talk about in, in our brief time together today is uh, another way that these advanced style influencers are defying the anti-aging market. And it's to not be so concerned about their wrinkles and their scars to the point of getting plastic surgery and getting makeup tutorials to hide their quote unquote imperfections that the beauty market would have us believe. Because in North America, the anti-aging beauty market, it is the multi-billion dollar industry telling us all that we should have perfect smooth skin, no matter what, especially on our faces, but also everywhere else. And there's a plethora of products out there to help us achieve the smooth skin for life. But here is Beatrix Ost, who is one of the US anti um, advanced style influencers who's fighting against the anti-aging beauty market. And she's quoted us saying, I've learned to turn horror into something beautiful. I've had skin cancer on my forehead twice. The second time left such a large hole, which I was horrified was going to change my facial expression. So she told the doctor, we, he had to think of something. And so he closed it the best he could, which left a jagged mark on my forehead. But I wanted to keep it instead of getting further plastic surgery to smooth it and make the whore into a beauty mark. So I got the scar tattooed and I decided to celebrate it. And that is how she, she, in her own way, through her Instagram account, is defying the anti-aging market by standing up to those that are saying we should always have smooth skin with as little imperfections as possible, but rather saying embrace uh, the horrors that you face and turn them into beauty uh, rather than hiding them. And so to summarize, 
uh, what we found is that the advanced style movement is part of a larger cultural conversation in the Western hemisphere that's generating new insights on how to deal with the uh, natural process of aging. And this cultural conversation is referred to as successful aging, which not only encompasses the avoidance of disease and disability, uh, but also the maintenance of high physical and, uh, and cognitive function, and most importantly, and most relevant to the advanced style movement, the sustained engagement in social and productive activities. So these regular women that are all over 50 have found a lucrative profession now in their retirement age as advanced style influencers. And they all work with brands, but they choose to work with the brands that are really not superficially um, wanting diversity as part of their marketing and advertising messages, but really embrace moving beyond fashion rules for women over 50 and moving beyond the anti-aging beauty market. So what are the next steps for my co-author and I in this project? We want to really focus on inclusive fashion brands that these influencers are collaborating with and answer the research question of how can more inclusive fashion brands and markets be built really inclusive, not superficially inclusive, just to make more money for one advertising campaign. And um, two, two brands we will be working with and are currently collecting data from is a startup in uh, Canada and Montreal, French Kiwis. They do eyewear and they feature one of our advanced influencers as well as a bathing suit company, uh, Somersault, that has inclusive bathing wear. And with that, I want to thank you all very much for listening. And I look forward to the Q&A portion of today's event. Thank you so much, Professor Verse. That was so fascinating, um, so current, not something I personally knew a lot about, and obviously same with our audience. So, so great. I'm so curious, though, what prompted you and your research partner to, to, to what inspired you to start researching this topic? It, it was the documentary. So yeah, okay. we, we saw the documentary, and we were just fascinated by the beautiful stories that um, our Ari Seth Cohen, the photographer, managed to bring to life. And then we unearthed the blog and the Instagram account and we were hooked because there, there really is very little options for women over 50, over 60 in the fashion market if they want to be fashionable and uh, have things tailored to them. So there are very few ready-made options for them. Right, and of course, right. the anti-aging market gets you ever younger. Um, so that that is scary. And we wanted to push against that with our research. Right, right. Well, and it's so thank you for sharing that. It's so interesting because with the last year and a half of the pandemic, and I was just listening to what you were saying about hair color, right? And how embracing gray hair is a big part of this, this movement and how the pandemic made it very difficult for people to maintain hiding their grade, right, for so long. And you saw, you know, um, Andy McDowell doing the cans red carpet with her gray hair, all of it. we've never seen her that way. And she's, she's going to 50 as well. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting time. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder how the, the pandemic will in, continue to influence this movement, you know, with that alone, you know. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, uh, one is from Imad. And he's, at, I'm assuming he uh, said, thank you very much. Are you working on male influencers as well? Oh, so, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, there is a growing movement that's been dubbed the, I think, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce it either, the Zadie or the Zaddy movement of male advanced style influencers. And uh, my colleague and I do have in mind as future research after we finish uh, this branding side uh, to focus on the male movement as well. So yes, indeed. 
But what, from preliminary observations, the main difference between the uh, female advanced style movement and the male Zadi or Zadi movement is that they also focus a lot on fitness. Um, so it's not just fashion. Uh, and for them, it's, it's fashion and fitness rather than fashion and beauty. So that, that's the main difference we've observed so far. Interesting, interesting. Okay, well, please keep us in mind because we'd love to have you back to talk about that. that oh, I'd love to be fascinating. back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another comment and question from the audience um, from Vidishi. This is very inspiring. Uh, I wish to know how your contribution is different from how consumers navigate the stigma by consumption practices. While your content is very novel, how will you be making the final contribution novel? That's the question. Oh, and, and, and no, not at all. Yeah. I, I can okay. see it written down, and, and it's yeah. uh, not a silly question at all, Vidushi. Thank you very much. So, uh, our novel findings are the strategies that um, I couldn't get into detail because of the time constraints of this webinar, but I did present a few uh, examples of the embodied strategies that these advanced style influencers are engaging in specifically online and on social media. So social media has become uh, a, a movement, a platform, if you will, for uh, consumers, everyday consumers to fight stigma, but also prosumers, and that's consumers and producers together, which uh, influencers are part of. So they consume the beauty products and the, the fashion that they also um, sell in a way to their fan base. So um, how prosumers are fighting stigma uh, from within the system, if you will, rather than, and they're doing so through social media, which has become a very powerful tool to do this. So that's uh, those are the unique contributions that we bring both to the literature, the academic literature, as well as to, to practice. Thank you. What did you notice in your research um, when, you, when you studied the, the influencers themselves? What did you notice in terms of racial diversity or sexual diversity? Like, what did you, what did you pick up on? Right. So, the, um, interestingly, the original advanced style influencers that made it big. So these are regular women that didn't work in the fashion or beauty industry before. They weren't models, but some of them were retired, uh, but they did tend to skew Caucasian. Um, and so now there is a, a big push to have true diversity, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, able-bodiedness diversity within the advanced style movement itself. So uh, we mm -hmm. did notice that the advanced style official blog, as well as the official Instagram account features a lot more diverse, um, older, mature women on their pages in terms mm -hmm. of uh, ethnic and racial makeup and um, for this project on um, making on brands and how brands and markets can be more inclusive, truly more inclusive. Uh, my co-author and I have picked five brands as case studies that really embrace various able-bodiedness, uh, racial and ethnic makeup, as well as uh, different ages. So going beyond just uh, women over 50 but having them as part of their market base as well. And various body types. It's important to also talk about that when we talk about uh, the fashion industry as well. Yeah, yeah, so many perspectives to bring to the space, right? Yeah, um, so the-, the and attitudes. From a theoretical perspective, what we're using is intersectionality theory for those of you right. that yeah. are interested. And that's bringing these different identities or demographic characteristics together and looking at them as one rather than as separate entities or units. Right. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question from Judith in the audience. How would you measure the extent to which these influences may have an effect on gendered ageism in the fashion and beauty, beauty market? So that, that's a great question. And we use third-party data for that uh, in order to measure 
how their fan base has grown on Instagram. So like one of them mentioned, she's really happy when other women on the street embrace their own unique style and don't succumb to the very strict style rules. And so we've, we've tracked their uh, fan base or audience on, on Instagram and it has only grown in, in the years and also how many brand collaborations they have. And that has also increased over the years as well with a wide variety of small brands as well as larger brands. CoverGirl being one of the largest mainstream brand that now features one of our advanced style influencers. So once brands in mainstream brands, popular brands that are global, once they, they reach the point of paying attention, of thinking, starting to think differently. Um, Victoria's Secret is also another mainstream brand that is moving away from the ideal woman and how she should look like to featuring very diverse angels in, in their, their fashion shows. So once mainstream brands uh, embrace this idea of true diversity or even start to think about it, then we know that uh, the advanced style influencers have, are starting to make a dent in the mm -hmm. fashion and beauty industries and people are starting to take notice from the management side. Awesome. It's such an interesting time in the world right now, like this reckoning that's happening in it. Of course, this is like, you know, it makes sense that this is happening in, in this space as well. Um, I really love this question from Yu Ting. It's sort of a, a question like, why is this even a thing? But he asked specifically, she, she asked specifically, why do you think companies have not pursued women over, over the, the women over 50 fashion market? Why is this even a thing? That, <laughs> you know? And that is very silly. Uh, it's a great question. And it's yeah. a very silly thing not to do because we found evidence of the so-called gray consumer or the silver market. So uh, especially in the Western hemisphere, and especially in North America, you have an aging population that has a high disposable income that they can spend on fashion and beauty and entertainment and uh, other experiences and home decor. And so we thought it, it of course, it's self-evident that companies and, and fashion designers, so clothing companies and fashion designers should go for the segment, but they shied away from it uh, for, uh, for social, sociocultural and historic reasons for this idea that women over 50, um, so there, there's this other idea of respectability um, if from it's a, a sociocultural construct, it's abstract, but it dictates that women over 50 should be invisible when it comes to their fashion choices and their makeup in society. So polite, uh, respectable women don't wear low cut tops and short skirts over a certain age. They don't wear bright colors. They don't wear fake eyelashes and bright lipsticks. And so uh, a lot of companies just blindly without thinking, even of their own profits, followed this general sociocultural trend because a lot of people in society don't stop and question taken for granted things. They just assume yeah. that this yeah. is the way things have always been done and this is the way things will always be done. We don't want grandma in a red mini dress with uh, pink hair. Why? I don't know. That's because somebody some time ago and a group of people in society decided that this is not respectable, that this shouldn't be. And so companies and marketers just follow suit. Um, are the fashion and beauty industries actually listening to these influencers? They're starting to. They're starting to, yeah. They're starting to. So some, yeah. some of the mainstream companies are doing it, what we refer to in our, our follow-up project as mm -hmm. superficial inclusivity. So they'll have it for a particular campaign or they'll have a secondary line, just a fashion line, just to try things out. Um, and the, it's a low risk, low reward strategy that comes across as insincere. Uh, while other companies, especially small startups, 
uh, and direct to consumer brands are um, engaging in more authentic diversity when it comes to their fashion and beauty lines. And they're taking the highest risks, um, but and hopefully the highest rewards, but that's uh, TBD to be determined since yeah. a lot of the, the brands we're studying um, are startups and they've started in the past five years, most of them in the last two. Right. So somewhat related, another question from Yu Ting, and you, you started answering it a bit, but how would you go about developing a go-to market strategy for women in fashion over 50? So I guess those companies that are doing it authentically, what is it that they're doing? Like, what does that look like? So uh, um, at this point in time, you have to think about product design as well and have a more inclusive design in mind. Um, so really thinking about the body changes that women in their 50s, 60s, 70s undergo uh, through and uh, figuring out the, the types of materials that they care about and the, uh, that will be more flattering and, and have different cuts and styles and, and really do your due diligence and your market research and talk to women uh, in your segment or, or mature consumers and see what they like. And from our own data set, we realized that uh, um, another thing these advanced style influencers really cared about was sustainability and the environment and not buying fast fashion and upcycling and recycling and thrifting and really caring about the whole uh, supply chain of the companies that they do support. So this would be a great go-to marketing strategy for a startup who wants to engage uh, or target segment and position themselves to women over 50. Have a sustainable, environmentally conscious product line that tailors to changing bodies and also is not frumpy or doesn't try to hide them, uh, not too many gray and black tones, but, but have color and have fun with patterns and designs. Right. Um, we have a, a comment um, from Judith. What would be great is to see more often especially for fashion for older women, people in marketing and private industry have yet to recognize the huge market potential, which is some of what you were saying already. You know. um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so thank you for that, Judith. Are there any, um, sort of the, the influence that you, influences you shared with us um, through your presentation, like I'm probably gonna look them up now and, and try to follow them myself, um, but are there any negative consequences to becoming a social media influencer? Uh, yes, the, this goes beyond uh, gender and age. So the negative consequences of becoming a social media influencer is uh, one of the main ones is burnout because you're constantly uh, being creative and producing content and uh, posting content and you're giving a lot of yourself and your identity online and your fans uh, and audience and followers constantly demand more or at the very least the same amount of, of posts and uh, of, to share part of yourself and part of your life. And so you have to, burnout can be real. Um, and also you have to be willing to, to be your authentic self both online and in real life and share your life with strangers, which is a very scary concept if you think about it. But mm -hmm. these influencers have turned their um, surprising fame into uh, fighting for causes. So they're, they're selective. So they all engage in style activism. They're very selective with the brands they work with. And increasingly they post about other social causes and social justice causes that we as a society should care about uh, and, and politics. So um, they're turning a potentially negative into a positive by having this platform, by having these listeners, uh, not all of their posts and their stories are directly related to their personal life, to their style journeys and to their brand collaborations. But they also speak um, politely about other causes that they personally care about, hoping 
some of their audience members will also care. Right. Um, and so we can follow them, perhaps not be demanding, but you know, follow them. Is there anything else we as, as uh, in the audience here today that we can do to get involved with combating uh, gender ageism other than following the influencers? Like following the influencers and supporting uh, brands, small brands, startups, local brands mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you care about beyond just mm -hmm. gender and age, gendered ageism, but with other causes because uh, our the, the old adage that you, you uh, vote with your dollars, that your wallet is powerful is true. So stop spending your money on companies doing shitty things for other people and the environment uh, and start spending your money on not superficially caring companies, but do your due diligence as critical consumers and spend your monies on companies and their owners that are trying to honestly do better than previous generations. Right. And I mean, this gives us another uh, lens through which to, to view our, our buying decisions or purchasing decisions or all, you know, um, if we didn't have it already, this, this is another one um, in terms of things that we should care about and things that matter. Absolutely. Um, this has been so fascinating. Thank you so much, Ella, for joining us today and for sharing all this information. We'd love to hear more about the next phase of your research. Um, this is just a critical piece of information that I would say doesn't have enough of a voice. So uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you all for your comments and questions. I really appreciate the discussion we had together. Okay. Um, so before you, you're welcome to, to turn your camera off if you'd like. Uh, but before we say goodbye to you in the audience, um, and thank you again for taking the opportunity to, um, to learn with us, uh, we do have one last question for you. Uh, and that is how you would rate your knowledge of the topic of uh, gendered ageism now after, after this presentation. Bye, thank you. That's great. And I'll give everybody a moment to respond. Um, Great, thank you for that. Um, please join us on Wednesday, August 18th at 12 noon. Uh, we have another lecture coming up titled Immunity and COVID-19, most timely. Um, and our upcoming fall lineup of Scholars Hub at Home events, um, as well as our other virtual events uh, are all listed on our website. Please feel free to stop by and check them out. Uh, Yorkie.ca slash alumni and friends. Until next time, Thank you very much. Keep safe and be well.